right, let's pray again, and we'll get started. Father in heaven, thank you that, again for the opportunity to look at this, uh, the research and the, the, your ways of dealing with children. Lord, um, give us wisdom and understanding, guidance, and your Holy Spirit. Please help us to understand these truths as you would have us to understand them. Speak through me. May I only share your words, and I ask in Jesus' name, amen. All right, I'm going to warn you, this is a lot of heavy science we're about to look at. So yeah, focus and concentrate. I'll try to move through it uh, in a clear and logical manner. But uh, here we go. We have seen 10, we, no, we've seen nine tactics, a lack of physical activity, overstimulation, too much study, testing, poor health and nutrition, age segregation, TV and electronics, education chiefly of the mind, a lack of training to think, and for tactic number 10, we have early formal academics. Early formal academics. This is one of Satan's master tactics for damaging good thinking abilities. Now, there's a lot to explain when it comes to considering what is, I mean, after all, what is early when we say early formal academics. You know, they've made a lot of changes recently in kindergarten classrooms. Kindergartens today are not what we used to uh, view them as. It's not this sort of fun and play and, and interactive sort of environment. We're adding a whole lot more academics in kindergartens now. They did a study recently titled, Is Kindergarten the New First Grade? And they compared kindergarten classrooms in 1998 and 99 with kindergartens in 2010 and 11. Just a 10 year difference, and they wanted to see what has changed in 10 years. Well, 10 years ago, or well, it's been uh, 16 years ago now, 29% of kindergarten teachers said that children should learn to read in kindergarten. 29% of them. 10 years later, it was 78%. In 98 53% of kindergartners were in full-day kindergarten programs, and 10 years later, 81%. Uh, is this a fair assessment for here in Australia? From what I'm gathering from people, that's a bit fair. About 80% in full-day kindergarten programs. Is that pretty common here? Yes? No? All right. <laughs> Hopefully so. From what I gathered from some of the other teachers I've talked to, that's about right. Time for art and music has dwindled, along with sand and water tables or science areas with objects to manipulate. I guess that stuff's too dangerous, so they're taking it away. 1998-99, 48% of kindergarten teachers considered reading fluently too much to expect of kindergartners. I would have to agree, that's a lot to expect out of a little child. Well, 10 years later, only 10% felt that way. 90% of kindergartners are being taught to read, 97% are in classes in which composing and writing complete sentences is a needed skill, and 99% are learning capitalization and punctuation in kindergarten. Kindergarten is not what it used to be. A lot of changes have happened. So we're expecting more and more and more out of early childhood. We're focusing more and more on academics because as a society, as a world, we view the academic training as, you know, the ultimate goal, right? Nothing else really matters. And, well, we could challenge that, I think, as Christians. Because of the extra pressure in kindergarten, now 84% of kindergarten teachers feel that attending preschool is important for success in kindergarten. If you want to do well in kindergarten, you have to go to preschool. Before you get there, you better already know how to use pencils and paintbrushes, know most of the letters of the alphabet, and be able to count to 20. You don't learn this stuff in kindergarten now. They expect you to know it before you get there. So a lot of administrators and parents and teachers, they're thrilled with these new developments. They say, hey, kids are learning. We're pressing forward to that mark of higher academics, right? Well, there's a significant body of major scientific research, some of the top input from top scientists around the world that are saying, wait a second. Yes, kids are learning. We're not questioning that kids are learning in the classroom, but are there unintended consequences to this process? Is it possible that we might be doing some harm through this process? Are kids missing out on important areas of development? That's the key thing that they often say, that we're, 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 we're cheating kids out of childhood almost. They're missing out on important landmarks of development. And they're suggesting that the price to pay isn't worth it, and this environment of higher academic standards at the early ages are doing more harm than it is good. The weight of evidence suggests that an academic setting before the age, here's what I mean by early, before the age of eight for girls, 10 for boys. 
And obviously, I'm not talking about learning. Don't misunderstand me here. Learning is great. Kids can learn so much in early childhood. We don't want to squash that. But when it comes to sitting them down with the textbooks and trying to teach a lot of these academic standards, um, they are better learned at a later age. And pushing it before the age of eight for girls and about 10 for boys is actually damaging to the mind. And I would argue one of Satan's master tactics for hurting good thinking abilities. Let's find out how this works, all right? Anyone know what this is? Yeah, somebody knows. What is it? A synapse? Oh, a stem, a stem, okay. Stem cell, it's, it's a neuron, it's a nerve, a neuron. Yeah, part, it's a brain cell. It's what your brain's made out of. It's what your brain uses for all of its functions, including listening to me right now, if you are. Now, you were born with about 100 billion of these. You don't have that many now, and that's a compliment because the whole process of brain development is one of specialization. Your brain identifies the neurons it needs and it begins weeding out the extra ones. For example, they say that a child is born with all the neurons needed to learn any language in the world. You, you, we were all born that way. But then, as you learned your native tongue, and maybe a second one, or a third language, it's great for kids to learn other languages at an early age, but as you learn that, your brain identified, oh, those are the neurons I need, and it starts tossing out the other ones. And that's why at about 13 years old is the break for good language development, we find, and it becomes a lot harder to learn a second language. Not impossible, but a lot more difficult. So that's the process as the brain sort of specializes and identifies the neurons it needs. But after or as it specializes, neurons also have to undergo another process known as myelination. Myelin is an electrically insulating compound that coats the axon of the neuron. You can see it here um, in these little sections and it speeds the information transfer because the, uh, the, the, the information begins to jump from one myelination, myelinated section to another. Myelin is electrically insulating, so it's like insulation on an on electric wire, and it speeds the transfer by about 100 times that of an unmyelinated neuron, very much faster. Myelination is essentially what makes a neuron usable. Pri previous to myelination, it's, it's just not even usable. It's a futile effort to try to get information to travel along an unmyelinated neuron. So, Trying to force the information transfer through an unmyelinated neuron is a futile effort, and therefore, by the same token, trying to force information transfer over an unmyelinated brain section will be a futile effort, or at least very inefficient at best. Now, this process occurs in stages and on a fairly set schedule. The brain tends to myelinate in, in, in various sections at a time. At birth, all but the most essential bodily functions are unmyelinated. Then we're gonna look at a brief schedule here. I won't go through all of this, but I just wanna focus on a few key points. From conception to 15 months, we have very basic brain development as, as the, the neurons in the body move from inner to outer, lower to higher. That's the basic principle of brain development. Inner to outer, so starting with the core muscles, moving into the limbs, the extremities, and lower to higher as it starts in the brain with the very basic thinking centers, moving into the higher thinking centers throughout development. At 15 months into four and a half years, we have limbic system and relationship development. This is why it is very key that little babies and toddlers are with their mothers, their parents, uh, their mothers specifically, as much as possible. This is the stage in which they're developing their understanding of emotional security. The limbic system is the emotional uh, generating area of the brain, and then relationship skills are developed now. At about four and a half to seven years, so that's a stage of development, we have right hemisphere elaboration. The word elaboration, same thing, myelination. Development, elaboration, myelination, I'll use those terms um, synonymously. Boys have a slower growth period during these stages, about a two year lag in right hemisphere development. Now I didn't say boys were slow. <laughs> God just made them to develop it differently. They take a bit longer with right hemisphere development. So then at about seven in girls and about nine in boys, so this isn't a stage of development here, this is the beginning of development for the right hemisphere, we see left hemisphere development or elaboration, myelination. And that's about seven in boys, about nine, uh, I'm sorry, seven in girls, nine in boys. And then at about eight years, we see frontal lobe myelination. And I just wanna focus on those three areas here. It's of particular interest to us in our studies of when children should go to school. Um, the frontal lobe, the left hemisphere, and the right hemisphere. Let's unpack this a bit. We have the right and left hemispheres of the brain. The right hemisphere deals with things now, before I get into what each of these brain areas deal with, I need to clarify, it's a myth that you're either right-brained or you're left-brained. You do use all areas of your brain, but each area does have its specific um, 
control, specific functions. And it's not that while the right hemisphere may deal with a certain number of things, it's not that you're going to find, you're not going to find those things anywhere else. It's just that this is the main processing center for these types of thinking. So here we go. The right hemisphere deals with things such as images, rhythm, emotion, intuition, imagination, creativity, feeling, faith, belief, and large motor control. Sort of the artistic side of the brain, if you will. The left hemisphere deals with things such as detail, parts and processes of language, linear patterns, logic, critical thinking, numbers, reasoning skills. This is more of the logic, the, 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 the processing side of the brain. All right, take your guess, sit down in the classroom studying the textbook as we know it. Which of these brain areas is going to be pretty important, most used? Left, absolutely. It's the left hemisphere, for sure. Yeah, why? Because, well, the parts and processes of the language, the linear patterns, the numbers, the logic, those things, you can find that studying in school. That, that's just how it works. Also, we have, and to clarify, not that you're not going to use the right hemisphere, but you need the left hemisphere. All right, the primary motor cortex is located within the frontal lobe, and that deals with fine motor development. Very important for many skills, refinements like handwriting. Inner speech is that ability to internalize concepts without having to say them out loud. Fine motor eye teaming, that's ability to use both eyes to focus on a subject. And foveal focus, which is two-dimensional focus. Reading is foveal, reading is two-dimensional. These, these all centered in the primary motor cortex, which is part of the frontal lobe. Okay, so back to this schedule of development. We see the right hemisphere developing up until about seven or, or even later, even 10 or 12 in boys and then the left hemisphere coming in at seven to nine. Are you seeing a problem? Yeah, an important area of the brain necessary for academic learning isn't beginning development until about seven in girls, about nine in boys. We definitely have a problem. The right hemisphere is organizing and myelinating from about four and a half to seven to 10 in girls and through 10 or 12 in boys, while the left hemisphere begins myelination between seven and nine. The primary motor cortex beginning at approximately eight years of age. So what's a typical school starting age here in Australia? Five. All right, five. That's what I'm hearing from everyone else. Five years old. That's long before the seven, right? That's long before the, the nine, if it's, a, if it's in the boys. There are some, by the way, there are some states in the U.S. that are beginning preschool at 18 months now. It's insane. <laughs> so five's not bad compared to that, but five is still a problem. Is it possible to accelerate learning? Can we speed this process up somehow? Get the brain developing faster. We like to think it was, but not quite. Academics can actually be damaging during this stage. It can actually create a disorganization of the thinking. To understand this, we need to understand what's known as neuroplasticity. The brain has an incredible ability that God has hardwired into us to adapt to the environment and to sort of fill in and mold itself around the environment and, and fit in as needed. I was talking with a neurosurgeon recently, and he was, we were talking about this topic a bit, and he was telling me about neuroplasticity, and he was saying how, he said, I could do uh, surgery on your brain. He said, and as long as I didn't take out too much, and as long as I didn't take out the wrong part, hopefully not, you know, <laughs> he said, your brain would then, after I sewed you back together, another area of your brain would come in, and it would fill in for the part that I took out. He said, but the problem is your brain will always be handicapped. It will never be as efficient as the correct region because the brain develops a lot of habits at birth, I mean from birth in the early developmental stages. And if you try to change something later on, you, you're, you're trying to mess with habits that have already been formed. So if we understand this neuroplasticity concept, and now we take this little boy here and he's in class and his left hemisphere is being asked to do a task for which it is not ready, What's going to happen? Well, based on neuroplasticity, we understand that another area of the brain will try to fill in for the left hemisphere. Remember I said earlier that the brain develops from lower into higher. So an already developed section at four or five or six or whatever is going to be a lower thinking center. That's the area that's gonna come in and try to fill in for the correct region. That's precisely what happens. It's a physiological occurrence that if a task is asked to the brain for which the corresponding region is not matured, it will form neural routes through lower, more developed sections resulting in almost permanent organizational damage. 
Trying to force a child to learn a concept for which they are not ready is actually damaging the unmyelinated brain. It's mixing up the learning patterns. It's mixing up the thinking abilities. It's disorganizing the brain. Clear so far? Is this making sense? We're laying a lot of foundation here. I want to make sure you're with me. Yes? Interactive here. Yes? All right, great. <laughs> Good. So this, these are my words. This is my explanation. Let's hear this from a scientist now. Before brain regions are myelinated, they do not operate efficiently. We've, we've identified that. That's a pretty um, clear point by now. For this reason, trying to make children master academic skills for which they do not have the requisite maturations may result in mixed up patterns of learning. If the right brain system isn't yet available or working smoothly, forcing may create a functional organization in which less adaptive lower systems are trained to do the work. That's essentially what we've just explained, but she's putting it in a nutshell for us, explaining how we're creating, she calls it functional organization. The brain's working, it's a different sort of organization, but it's functioning. I kind of like functional disorganization. You know, isn't, it's not the original organization that God has designed. And the thing to remember is this is a fairly permanent occurrence. There are remedial treatments out there. There are ways to help children learn after this has happened, of course. Um, you know, this is, God isn't limited um, to this. God, uh, we serve an amazing God that can, can help no matter what has happened. But we have to consider that the brain is um, wanting to develop according to the environment that it is given, and it's forming a lot of habits early on. So let's say you start at five. By the time they get to seven or eight, you've got three, you know, two, three years of habit being formed through the lower thinking center, and it's routed over and over and over. And then when you have a different, a higher thinking center come in, the brain isn't just going to automatically go, oh, here comes another one and reroute the thinking. No, it's already got a habit there, and it's going to naturally gravitate toward those areas. Um, so there, like I said, there are remedial treatments. Ask me about those in the Q&A if you like. But um, it's important to remember this is a fairly permanent occurrence, and that's why it should be taken with utmost in caution. Trying to drill higher level learning into immature brains may force them to perform. They can perform. They can put the answers down on paper. But they're performing with lower level systems and we're impairing the higher level systems. So a lot of children, they seem like they're doing okay, you know, they're putting the answers down on paper, they're doing well, supposedly in school, but then once they, they, they get into the more higher level thinking, they might struggle with those things more because we've routed it through the basic thinking centers of the brain. Any learning that has to be pushed into a child may end up doing more harm than good. Plunge daily into the fire of inappropriate expectation, children's early promise shrivels, and non-learning becomes a habit. Habit. They may be labeled, treated, exhorted, and eventually tutored, but the basic issue remains unchanged. The school and the child are on different schedules. We have schools and children on different schedules, and that is a problem. I'm going to skip through a bit of this. Uh, this is all on my DVD. If you're missing some of these quotes or if I'm going too fast, you can watch it on there. I want to touch on the impact on vision. The, uh, the development of the eye is of particular interest to early childhood. The ability for eye teaming, that's the ability to use both eyes to focus on a subject, and the ability to use foveal focus, which is two-dimensional focus, doesn't fully develop until approximately age nine. Less than 5% of your vision actually occurs in your eyes. So you're thinking, wait a second, what do I have eyes for? <laughs> well, your eyes are a lens for your brain. You see with your brain through the lens of your eyes. For full vision to occur, information from all cerebral lobes must be accessed. But the problem is if we don't have all cerebral lobes developed yet, full vision hasn't been quite, they're, not, they're gonna struggle a bit with deciphering what they're reading. That's exactly what Dr. Raymond Moore puts in his book, School Can Wait. Even though a single clear visual image may be received by the eye, a child still may not be able to decode printed material because of deficiencies in organization and interpretation in the central nervous system due to lack of maturation. So he's just saying that they can see the physical object. It's not that they're blind, but when it comes to decoding and understanding what they're reading, um, the brain hasn't quite caught up with the eyes. Also, let's just look at a physical standpoint of the eye development. Before age seven, those ciliary bodies in the eye that control the shape of the lens, they're short. That allows maximum three-dimensional peripheral and distance vision. Where do you get three-dimensional peripheral and distance vision? Sitting there reading a book or playing outside? Playing outside. I mean, that's the natural place you're going to find three-dimensional peripheral and distance vision. And then at about age seven, those ciliary bodies lengthen, and that allows for more foveal or two-dimensional vision. Also, the eyeball itself doesn't completely shape with collagen fibers until approximately age nine. So these longer periods of reading uh, can actually cause an inflammation of the eyeball, which can then lead to myopia or nearsightedness. 
Myopia has become an epidemic in recent years. The US, the rate of nearsightedness has increased 66% since the 1970s. But this is not just a US problem. Rates of myopia, difficulty seeing distant objects are soaring. The trend is matched in many other countries, causing eye doctors to wonder what can be causing the decline in human vision. Currently, the US is at 50% myopic. Now that's pretty staggering to me, that's pretty bad. I'm a bit embarrassed about that as, a, as an American myself. But we're far from the top. East Asia is 90% myopic. Seoul, Korea is 96% myopic. That's a problem. Now scientists have long been wondering what is causing this rapid increase in myopia because this is not the way it's been historically. We have not had this problem in the past. This is a very new phenomenon and they're trying to figure out what is causing it. Now, they used to think, and the standard answer today even, if you go to your eye doctor, most eye doctors will say it's genetic. There's nothing you can do about it, they say. If your parents had bad eyes, you'll have them too and that's just the way it is. Research has found, though, that genetics are only a small factor in this problem. They did a study in Alaska, that's a northernmost state in the United States, up there past Canada, and it was one of the last states to become a state and start requiring schooling for its children. Um, so they had a very unique situation uh, because they're so remote. Uh, school was a pretty new idea to them. <laughs> so they had parents and grandparents who had not really been to school, at least very little, and then they had children and uh, and young people who had gone to school at the customary age of, of about five. They looked at the rate of myopia in the children and it was about 60%. 60% of the children were myopic. They expected, based on uh, what they believed about myopia, that it's, since it's genetic, they should find approximately the same rates, close to 60%, in the parents and grandparents. The problem was they couldn't find it. And I think it was less than 1% in the parents and grandparents. And they said, hang on a second, there goes the genetics theory because this just can't be, gen genetics don't change that fast. So they begin looking around the world. And around the world, the rates of myopia are consistently higher in the more schooled regions than in the indigenous or unschooled regions. U.S. 50%. East Asia, famous for a high pressure in academics. They push it, you know, sorry to the Asians here, but <laughs> you all know this is, a, this is common. They push it pretty hard. And they spend, you know, twice the amount of homework that the average U.S. child has. They have the highest rates of myopia in the world. It's definitely a connection there. Africa, a country predominantly indigenous, they at least spend a lot of time outside, they're at 10 to 20% myopic. Natal, Brazil, 13.3% myopic, now that's pretty low, but they looked at the indigenous tribes around the city and found it to be 2.7%. Again, the, the, the research seems to point very clearly to the more time these people are spending out of the classroom, the better the rates of myopia. Now, in addition to time spent studying, scientists have identified that the time spent outside is a very key indicator of the rates of myopia. According to the Journal of Nature, children who spend less time outside were at greater risk of developing myopia. In Taiwan, teachers were asked to send their kids outside for an 80-minute period each day, while a school right down the road did not send their kids outside. At the end of just a one-year study, in the school that had sent their children outside, the children were 8% myopic and the one who had not sent their children outside, those were 18%. Same people group, same basic genetic pool, you know, all that same stuff. It was, it was just a clear correlation between the time spent outside. Now, part of the reason for this benefit is the time spent looking at text more distant, or, you know, objects more distant than text on a page. We know that close-up work is particularly damaging to the eye and can create myopia or hyperopia, which is farsightedness. But, Scientists have identified that, found that the, the bright light you experience outside is actually a pretty good indicator of the rate of myopia and pretty good, um, it's beneficial to the eyes. Now to understand this, we need to understand what is myopia. I mentioned earlier it's an inflamed eyeball. So a normal eye is very rounded in shape with a focal point right at the back of the eyeball. Then a myopic eye becomes elongated and it changes the focal point from the back of the eyeball to farther up and that makes the more distant objects blurry. And hyperopia, which is farsightedness, is the reverse of this. It makes the focal point behind the eyeball and, and it makes, um, uh, you know, does, has the opposite effect. But so that is the myopic eye. It's an inflamed eyeball. It gets inflamed and it elongates. Okay, and so what they found is that light stimulates the release of dopamine in the retina. And this neurotransmitter, in turn, blocks the elongation of the eye during development. 
So dopamine in the retina, isn't that a neurotransmitter? <laughs> it is a neurotransmitter. We used to think it was just in the brain. They're finding it in the eye. It's called retinal dopamine, and it's blocking the elongation of the eye. What's releasing the dopamine? Light. Light is blocking that elongation. The eyeball becoming inflamed. Light is actually blocking that process from happening. Retinal dopamine is normally produced on a diurnal cycle, meaning that it goes up during the day, and it tells the eye to switch from rod-based nighttime vision to cone-based daytime vision. Researchers now suspect that under dim, typically indoor lighting, the cycle is disrupted with consequences for eye growth. Based on epidemiological studies, Ian Morgan, who's a myopia researcher at the Australian National University, uh, close to home here, he has found that children need to spend around three hours per day under light levels of at least 10,000 lux to be protected against myopia. All right, a couple numbers we should unpack here. First of all, how many hours a day does that say? Three, that's a lot of time outside. That's more than the average child is getting, that's for sure. Some children don't get any. You know, they spend time in school and they, you know, except from walking back and forth to the vehicle in the house, that's about all the outside time they get. They need a lot more than, than, than just that. They need at least three hours a day. But then this 10,000 lux, what in the world is 10,000 lux? Lux is a measurement of the volume of the light. So not the intensity per se, but a volume of the light. Daylight is 10,000 lux. So they say if you go outside on a bright sunny day and stand under a tree, so it's not full sunlight, but full daylight, you're getting about 10,000 lux. As I mentioned, it's a measure of the volume of light. So take this window here. You could go outside the window. You'd be getting about 10,000 lux. Come inside and you still have that same volume, but it becomes dissipated into the room. And so the lux begins to drop as you come into the room. So if daylight is 10,000 lux, who wants to guess what the average well-lit classroom or office is in a lux measurement? Well-lit here. How many lux? 2,000. That's a great guess. Unfortunately, it's only 500. <laughs> Far below the 10,000 necessary for proper eye development. I heard recently uh, that in New Zealand they're requiring now that offices are built with a minimum of 700 lux. And I said, that's great, but that's not 10,000. <laughs> we need 10,000. 10,000 is full daylight. There was a, a family I knew, I was talking with the mother recently, and she was telling me the story of her daughter, who was about oh, 14 or 15 at the time. And she was telling me the story from a couple years back. She was about um, 12, I think, 12 or 13. She had severe myopia, and she was going for yearly checkups to the eye doctor. And one year, she was at the eye doctor, and he looked at her eyes and said, you know, I'm really sorry, but at the rate your myopia is progressing, you're going to be legally blind within one year. Can you imagine hearing that as a teenager? You're going to be legally blind within one year. It was pretty devastating to her. And so the mother talked to the eye doctor and said, well, what's causing this? Is there anything we can do about it? And what's the standard response? The eye doctor says, it's genetic. There's nothing you can do about it. He said, you know, the mother had bad eyes, so the, the daughter's going to have it too. Thankfully, the mother refused to believe that. She went and did some research. She came across Dr. Morgan's research about spending three hours outside every day. She said, well, that's interesting because my daughter always has liked to sit inside and read. She rarely goes outside. She's always indoors, always reading, always studying. She said, I wonder if there's a connection. So she said, great, we're going to make a change to the family schedule. They lived in a nice climate of, uh, of Florida in the United States. So she um, started spending three hours outside every day. Six months went by. They're back at the eye doctor. And uh, he checked her eyes out and said, wow, I'm not really sure what happened. I guess my diagnosis was a bit wrong. Good news, your myopia is the same as it was six months ago. It hasn't progressed at all. And they said, great. I don't even think they told the doctor what they were doing. They went back home, spent another six months going outside for three hours every day. Came back. Now it's been a year. The point at which she should be legally blind and the eye doctor checks her eyes out and says, I'm not believing this, but your myopia has regressed. That's not supposed to be possible. Myopia is not supposed to be curable. Her myopia was better a year later than it should have been uh, previously. How simple is that? I mean, like, uh, this isn't a complicated treatment. And this wasn't even preventative. You know, this was treating something that's not even supposed to be treatable. So kids really, really need the outdoor time, and they're just not getting that in this indoor, uh, primarily indoor environment uh, with dim light. The eyes need to actively experience the world as a whole for vision to develop fully, and this formal schooling environment places demands on the eyes that are unreasonable and damaging. All right. 
Movement. Physical activity is key to proper development. I've already identified that is very important. I'm going to skip over the cerebellum. We've already talked about that and touch on the brain-derived neurotropic factor. This is a very important brain chemical that enables uh, neurons to be protected against cell stress and death. It encourages new neurons to grow. But there's more to it than that. This process of myelination, when you look at it from a chemical standpoint, and you look at the, the little atoms and the chemicals and the molecules as they're all interacting with each other that's enabling the myelination process to proceed, you will find elevated levels of BDNF. It's absolutely required for the myelination process to uh, proceed. Elevated levels of BDNF during the early stages of myelination increase the speed and extent of the final process. Great, you're saying, but BDNF, where do I get that? Can I go to the health food store and get that? No, you can't. It is released from your working muscles. When I move my muscles like this, these muscles, my biceps right now, are secreting a protein known as IGF-1, and that stimulates the release of BDNF into the bloodstream, and that allows for this myelination process to proceed. It's very good for the brain. So, literally, kids have to move for their brain to development. It's, it's, it's a physical connection there that they literally have to move around, get some physical activity for their brain to develop properly. Small children should be left free as lambs. <laughs> I love that. To run out of doors free and happy should be allowed the most favorable opportunities to lay the foundation for sound constitutions. <clears throat> Another area that's particularly damaged by the early classroom is that of language development and inner speech. Inner speech is that ability that most of us have, uh, typically, to internalize concepts without having to say them out loud. Um, I won't confess, I won't ask you to confess if you're guilty of talking through things out loud. I'm sure we all do it still, but most of us are capable of internalizing a concept without having, without having to talk it through. But if you watch a little child playing, even playing by themselves with no one else to talk to, they're typically talking to themselves, right? That's because they don't have this ability known as inner speech. They have to talk through things out loud to fully understand them, comprehend them, figuring things out is key. So good language, like the synapses that make it possible, is gained only from interactive engagement. Children need to talk as well as to hear. Interactive engagement is the key here. And you sit them down in the classroom, they're not getting a lot of interaction. It's more being talked to and not with. They need the, the, the physical or the, the, the interactive language engagement for proper uh, inner speech to development. And um, inner speech is key for not just academic skills but, and language skills, it's also key for good behavior. Um, internalizing your concepts can help children have better behavior. Anyone here want a well behaved child? Only one. Learned helplessness. Um, we often are creating a problem in children when we force it on them too soon, too, too much, too soon, as they get overwhelmed and they believe that they can't learn it. A child who is required to learn things before he is ready may quickly tire of them, or he may become anxiety-ridden and so frustrated that he will not try at all. I'm sure we've all experienced this to some degree or another, becoming a bit overwhelmed. And we see this in many children. It often develops in terms of a subject failure. They believe that they're bad at math or they're bad at, at some particular subject when the reality is it was just put on them too much, too soon. And if they had a bit of a chance to, to um, figure it out for themselves or just waited a couple years, a lot of times they would have caught on very quickly. Okay, you may be asking though, now hang on a second. We're talking about delaying the formal academics. How in the world will they ever catch up? Won't they be forever behind? If I wait until 8 or 10 to start school, how will they ever catch up with the rest of the, the world? Well, that's not much of a concern because when children start academics after age 8, they usually end up far ahead of the early starters. Why? Because when they're given time for their minds to develop, they'll experience much less frustration when the academics begin, and then they'll learn much faster because they're ready to learn it. In a study of 300 individuals who started school at about age 8 or later, all of them quickly caught up with their classes and in most cases performed well above the class average. <clears throat> most late starts, usually without formal training before their first school enrollment, quickly catch up academically and often pass their more school experienced peers. And the late starters generally excel in behavior, sociality, and leadership. Those are three important areas. We don't want children deficient in behavior skills, sociality skills, and leadership skills. 
Now you're wondering, okay, why is this improving those areas? It's because those three things, the foundation for those things are laid in the earlier years of life. So as we're focusing on something else early on, we're missing out on those important areas of development. Research shows pretty clearly that if the brain is ready for it, all of the learning necessary for success in high school can be accomplished in only two or three years of formal skill study. Research indicates it only takes about 30 contact hours to re learn reading to a college proficient level. 30 hours! And we usually spend, what, years you know, drilling the reading skills. If the brain's ready for it, they'll catch on a lot more quickly. It's like this. Let me give a, 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 a rather imperfect example, but just for sake of illustration here. Uh, maybe my numbers and examples are a bit off, but let's just use this as a hypothetical situation. Suppose that in first grade you start off with learning the basic addition of ones. So you have 5 plus 3, 6 plus 2, and you do this, this drill, repetition, over and over and over and over until the child finally comprehends it, and you're pushing them along because the brain's not quite ready for it, so you just taxing it and encouraging along little, 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 little. And then you get to, to grade two, and now you add the basic addition of tens. Then grade three rolls around, and you add the uh, addition of, of hundreds. And so again, repetition, repetition, repetition. They finally get that concept. Fourth grade rolls around, and you add the addition of thousands. Yes, I know these numbers might be a bit incorrect, but, but consider the illustration here, hypothetical here. Suppose, though, that you wait until fourth grade. Now, I would hope that a child can learn some addition through everyday life. You know, you don't, school is not the only place they're going to learn some addition. But uh, just suppose you kept them from it, and they get to fourth grade. It's now time to start math, and uh, the brain's ready for it, fully able to comprehend these subjects. You start off with addition of ones, five plus three, do a couple examples, maybe something in real life. Sure, got that, no problem. You've laid a good foundation, the brain's ready for it. Okay, move on, addition of tens, sure, understand that. Addition of hundreds, sure, addition of thousands. And in an hour, or two, or a couple days, you've learned this whole process, this whole concepts of addition far better and, and far quicker than they would through four years of drill. Does that make sense, my hypothetical scenario working? Okay, great. So it's not that um, you're going to start them off in, in first grade at, at age 10 and then keep them grade by grade year by year. Of course they'd be behind if you did that. The idea is that when the brain's ready for it, they'll catch on quickly and they'll learn things um, better in the long run. You know, we have to realize, you look at school curriculum, it's very repetitive. It just adds a little bit each year, a little bit each time, and you do it over and over and over and over, when we really just need to look at conceptual learning. What are they capable of learning? How fast can they learn it? If they understand the concept, then move on. You know, I was recently, okay, before I tell that story, let me, let me preface this a little. It's great, though, to learn many things in the practical everyday life. We saw the example with the children, or with the, the, the little boy counting the blocks. You know, that's, he learned some math through that. You can learn fractions in the kitchen. You can learn science in the garden. I mean, there are great ways to learn in the everyday life. You can teach many of the things that you would learn in school. You can learn them through the everyday life. And that's the way it should be. And I used to believe that was absolutely necessary. I've recently changed my mind on that though, as I was earlier this spring, I was in Tanzania, Africa, doing some teacher training at a primary school, and I presented some of this information. I opened it up for questions, and uh, one of the native teachers raised his hand and said, well, I don't really have a question, but I just wanted to sh share my experience. I said, sure. He said, well, I was a herds boy until I was 13. And so, first world countries, we can incorporate all this practical stuff in the everyday life, all the academic learning. Third world countries, it doesn't happen so much. You know, they're, they're just spending time outside. They're not really learning much about school until they actually go to school. So, and that's what he told me. He said, I didn't know anything about school. He said, 13 years old, I finally convinced my family to let me go to school. Maybe a younger brother had grown up so he could then go herd the cows. So off to school he goes. He's there for two months. And it comes time for the national exams. And uh, the, the exams are pretty impressive. I've seen their, their exams, and I, I was quite amazed at what they're asking of the students, more advanced than I had seen in many uh, first world countries. So I, when he said it came time for the national exams, I knew this was pretty serious, what he was talking about. And this wasn't the exam for first grade. This was the exam for his age level at 13. He's been in school for two months. His teacher says, no, you can't take the exams. You don't know anything about this. And he said, well, uh, school hasn't been that hard so far. It seems I've been catching on pretty quickly. He said, just let me try. So he took the exams and scored top of the school. Two months in school. 
And I thought, wow, this guy is a genius. And I said, thank you for your comment. Appreciate that story. Another one raises his hand. Well, I was a herds boy until I was 12. And I convinced my family to let me go to school. <laughs> and it came time for the national exams after six months of being in school. And my teacher didn't want me to take them, but I took them anyway, and I scored top of my school. I thought, wow, there's two geniuses here. He puts his hand down, another one raises his hand. Well, I was a herds boy until the <laughs> same story. Four or five times this happened. And it just really impressed me with the fact that God's methods work. He says children should be free as lambs early on. The physical activity is important. And, you know, sure, you do want to incorporate the everyday learning in, in all aspects of life. I'm not against that. By all means, incorporate that. But evidently, you can go herd cows and still do okay in school once it comes time uh, because the brain is going to be ready for it. Um, I could share this from countless other experiences. I had a similar experience myself. I um, didn't start school until I was 11. I did no more than about an hour and a half of school every day because uh, our family was rather poor and um, I had to work and uh, try to help make ends meet. I ran a business and had many other activities. We had a farm. Um, so I, I didn't get a lot of school time, but I even, I'd started at 11, you know, so you'd think I'd be pretty disadvantaged and I had no problem in scoring in the top 1% on the national test scores. Uh, and I, I know, I have many friends that have done the same. I have a friend who spent no more than, an, he said like an hour, hour and a half each day, maybe sometimes in school. <laughs> he, he started at, at 11 or 12, I think it was 11. He graduated high school at 17 and went into engineering in college with no problem. So God's methods work. We just, it's so weird to us. Society pressures the wrong direction, but really this is, it, it makes common sense. You know, when the brain's ready for it, it's gonna learn faster. So when you just think about it from that aspect, it will make, um, it, it will make a difference. You know, and consider for a moment, I just have some stats here. I won't share them all, but because it's more pertaining to a U.S. audience. Uh, but the U.S. is doing terribly in its educational system. And yet they are continually pushing earlier and earlier. And you know, there's, I think there's a connection there. Compare that to some of the Scandinavian countries who traditionally and historically, it's changing a bit now, but traditionally they haven't started until seven, eight, nine years old in school. And they score top in the world on many of their academic standards. So um, we, would, we would stand to look at the, the results of each system and how they're doing. Socialization skills, though, I just want to touch on that. You know, I've already touched on age integration and how that's better for socialization, but consider also the interaction. You know, we used to believe that, we get, there it is, that emotion, the emotion area of the brain and the cognition area of the brain, these are these kind of two separate regions and they didn't really have much to do with each other. And we now realize that's completely false. The emotion and cognition areas of the brain sorry, there you go, are uh, very intertwined together. And because of this, children need their basic emotional needs met in order for them to do well academically. They find that the brain focuses first on meeting the emotional needs, and it will shut off other types of learning until those needs are met. I worked with a little boy um, a while ago. I actually did a research project when I was in college, and he was about five years old, and he was having some really severe uh, emotional problems, some f severe behavioral problems, and uh, just, a real problem child, had a lot of issues. Uh, so I wanted to see what was going on, and so I, I looked a bit into his family life, and I realized that his father was in school, wasn't spending much time with him, and his mother spent most of her time on social media and was not uh, interacting with her children very much. He had constant access to peers at school, to siblings in the home. It wasn't a matter of socialization. He had plenty of socialization, if, if, if we identify socialization as interaction with those of his own same age. But he didn't have very much parental involvement, not very much um, interaction with those who were uh, older and more mature than he was. So I started a research project and I, I spent two months with twice weekly visits for about a half hour per visit. And uh, we would just do fun stuff together. We'd go outside and go for a hike or we'd uh, you know, play in the garden a bit or, or I taught him a little bit of piano. You know, I just spent time with him, that was the main point. And at the end of two months, this little boy was completely changed. The anger management issues were gone. The behavior problems were vastly improved to the point that his mother, who hardly ever noticed anything, actually noticed and thought that her boy was behaving so much better and wondered why he liked me so much. Uh, <laughs> maybe I was spending time with him, you know? And it just impressed me with the fact that 
I was spending such a little amount of time, you know, just a half hour, twice a week, that is not very much time, and it made such a great impact on this little boy. How much better if the parent, if the mother, had devoted that time uh, at an early age? That's what really is most important. As Dr. Moore put very well, a child relates to the people and to the world primarily through interaction with parents or parent surrogates. Even the best daycare cannot completely neutralize the negative social, emotional, and cognitive effects of mother-child discontinuity. When a child is allowed to develop a strong bond with an adult, especially a parent, a much more emotionally stable and socially competent child will be the result. Okay, a few other quick points I want to mention. Memory skills. Do children need to go to school to learn how to memorize things? That's, I've heard that argued before. It's definitely not necessary. Uh, take many indigenous peoples around the world. They have phenomenal memories without having to go to school to learn how to do this. The North Queensland Aborigines, for example, recite a song by memory that takes five nights to complete. Primitive peoples can observe a herd of several hundred animals and detect the absence of a single animal and know which one it is without counting. Many of their vocabularies are full of names for very detailed aspects of the world around them. Um, I, I, as it's talking about uh, detecting the absence of animals, I uh, also referenced when I was in Tanzania, there was a, the institute I was at had a large livestock program, and I was talking with a livestock manager who uh, was also from the U.S., and she said that sometimes they'll bring a herd of 70-some cows into the watering hole in the evening, and their native herdsmen will look and go, we're missing such and such a cow. We're missing, you know, and they'll talk about it amongst themselves. We're missing a cow. I wonder where she is. And finally, this, my friend, her curiosity got the best of her, and she finally asked these natives, how do you know you're missing such and such a cow? I can't tell the difference. How do you just look at the herd and know? And they looked at her like, how do you not know you're missing the cow? You know, isn't that common knowledge? <laughs> it, it, nobody, they didn't sit down with a book and try to memorize cows. You know, it was a part of their life. So evidently, um, school maybe isn't all that helpful for memorization. I think the, the key to this, as, as um, Dr. DeCharle explains, while the schooled person depends heavily on external signs, such as the written word or Google, to, <laughs> I added that, to hold knowledge for him, the primitive native depends on memory. Every detail of the landscape is remembered with what seems to be a photographic memory, even the first time passing through. Though most children have an eidectic memory, it is rare among schooled adults, but not among primitive non-schooled adults. You know, I think it's like this. I used to have a really good sense of direction. If I'd been there once, Five years later, I could get you there again. I've noticed, though, now that I have this handy smartphone, I don't have the sense of direction I used to. Why? Because I'm letting something else hold the knowledge for me. I punch in my address, I set it on the dash of my car, and off I go. And I think that's the principle here. As, as we let other things hold the information, we, we, we bring children up in a system where there's always a reference, always a book to look it up in, then um, we're, we're actually decreasing memory skills. The effect on boys, because there is a lag, about a two-year lag in brain development, uh, right hemisphere development in boys compared to girls, the effects we've discussed will be intensified in boys, and we see this in the educational system today. Boys today are not learning as well as girls. Boys receive 70% of the Ds and Fs given all students. Boys cause 90% of classroom discipline problems. 80% of all high school dropouts are boys. Millions of American boys are on Ritalin and other mind-bending control drugs. Three out of four students labeled learning disabled are boys. Did God create boys to just be a problem? No, obviously not. Why are we having these problems? Well, as I mentioned, all the effects, that, all the struggles that we've identified will be intensified in the boys, and we can see the results there. God created boys to be leaders in their families, to be spiritual leaders in their churches and their families, and we're decreasing it through this, in, through this environment as we are, we're essentially dumbing them down almost, you know, telling them that they can't learn like the girls can, and it's giving, um, it's creating some problems. <clears throat> but what about reading skills? Don't children need to learn reading early or they'll never learn how to read well? It is a myth that they'll never learn reading well if they don't learn um, at an early age. In fact, learning later usually results in better, uh, better results. A lot of parents are worried that their child learned to read on time. Well, what's on time? Maybe we should identify what's on time. Who says five's on time? Why can't it be seven? What's really on time? The Early Childhood Research Quarterly is one of the top research journals around the world, and they have done a lot of studies on reading skills and found that the foundation of later reading, and in particular reading comprehension, is language. Language, okay. We want to build a foundation for good reading. How do we do that? Through language skills. How do we build good language skills? Anyone, how do we build good language skills? 
talking precisely, talking together, simply holding conversation. It doesn't mean sitting there with a book and memorizing um, uh, vocab sheets, and yeah, definitely not sitting there texting, <laughs> that's not gonna help. It's talking together, interactive engagement. Back to what Dr. Healy said earlier, simply holding conversation. Now look, most toddlers are great at this. You give them a chance, and they are going to talk, and there's no problems there. So also we could use books and reading as a source of gaining needed information about something rather than a boring drill you have to put them through. In the US we have a reading series called the Dick and Jane Reading Series. And it starts off with Dick and Jane. And then it's Dick and Jane ran. And then Dick and Jane ran fast. And Dick and Jane ran with Spot. And they go through this endless boring, how boring is that? I mean, it's not, it doesn't make any difference to the child what Dick and Jane did. What they want to know is some question that's pertinent to them. So when they ask a question and you're like, I don't know, let's go look it up. And you get out the encyclopedias or a book or something and they learn that a book is a source of needed information. Have interesting stories instead of boring drills to read. You'll treat them to, or you'll, you'll train them to uh, enjoy books. Learning to read can be quite easy if we let it be. Often we're hindering the reading process by trying to drill it early and we make them tired of it and, and sick of, of trying to learn how to read. The key is to build the language foundation through a lot of talking, read to them, treat books as a source of needed information, have the physical activity so their mind's fresh, and then as they ask questions, you feel free to answer them. They want to know how to spell something. They want to know how to write a letter, how to... Um, you know, write something or read a word or something. You know, you answer those little questions in the everyday life. They're apt to ask those things anyway. And then many children can teach themselves how to read. I have met countless parents who have told me that, you know, one day their child comes up to them and says, Mom, I want to read you a story. As this one mother was telling me, uh, her son comes up, I want to read you a story. She said, okay, fine, you know, go ahead, read me the story. And she's expecting the book upside down in a made up story, you know. Well, he opens the book and read the story. And she's like, how do you know it? Oh, he just memorized it. So she turns to another one. She says, read me this story. He, she knew he didn't know it. And he read her the story. She's like, wait a second. That's my job. I'm supposed to teach you how to read. How do you know how to read? You know? He had, and she thought about how he had learned to do that. And it was just a natural process. She had built all the foundations. And when his brain was ready for it, he pieced it together and the reading blossomed. And usually this actually occurs um, before eight or 10. I mean, I've met many students who have learned at you know, eight, nine, 10, but, but many others will do it at five or six. Um, the key is though not to force it so the brain likes the experience instead of this boring thing they have to go through. The, um, this early childhood research quarterly actually looked at uh, two groups of children. One had a reading instruction age of five and another reading instruction age of seven. That's what the RIA stands for. So the earlier RIA group had initially superior letter naming, non-word, word and passage reading, but this difference in reading skill generally disappeared by age 11. The later RIA had generally greater reading comprehension. So they looked at the chart measuring average decoding and reading fluency. And uh, we have the dark at age five, the light at age seven. Maybe I should switch. Can you see this one better? All right. Uh, the dark at age five, the light at age seven. So at age five, we have some starting to read. Age six, they're continuing on. Evidently, somebody's taught themselves how to read there. These haven't been taught yet officially. But then at age seven, the, the next group comes in. Age eight, look how quickly they're progressing. And then by age nine, they've completely caught up. By age 11, they're passing up those who have started earlier. They uh, continued, if I get the right slide here, there we go. They continued this study into a few later years and they found that the earlier readers' abilities sort of plateaued while the later readers continue to advance in their abilities. Um, it wasn't, their, their abilities hadn't been stunted because the reading abilities hadn't been routed through the lower thinking centers. The Montessori children had an advantage in reading over the public school children at age five, but not at age 12. So a lot of people ask about the Montessori schools. The Montessori schools do have some good ideas. I'm not totally against them at all, but they do have a bit of a, a, a wrong push for the early reading. They're typically teaching it at a very early age and Sure, it shows up as an advantage early on. You think it, they're doing well, but that difference disappears by age 12. So they concluded by saying that our findings suggest that success at reading is not assured by an earlier beginning. Look, you know, I was talking with a mom recently and she's like, I just don't want my child to get to age 12 and not know how to read well. And I said, of course you don't, you know? And so her solution to that was she was teaching her child how to read at like two, 18 months or two or something. That was her solution. 
And I said, but look, look at the statistical evidence. Sure, nobody wants their child to get to 12 and not know how to read, but what's the statistical evidence? So err on the side of statistical probability, the ones who start later end up better readers. There's no guarantees, but if you want to err on the side of, of, uh, of statistical probability, start later. Um, often that ends up with better reading skills. Last point I want to make is that of spirituality. We kind of tie, bring, come full circle here as we look at what our main goal is for early childhood. The right hemisphere, uh, my slide's a bit incorrect, it doesn't totally control spirituality, but it, it very much influences and, and um, is, a, is a major player in the understanding of, of moral things and conscious development and spiritual understanding. Now, the early years are a critical period for the right hemisphere. A critical period is a window of time where the brain has to have a particular type of stimulation or it will miss out. It will never do well after this critical period. So literally, we have a critical window of development for the development and, and, of, um, and encouragement of moral understanding of spirituality. Also, pressure to develop the left hemisphere suppresses the development of the right hemisphere at an early age. So, and that's why I've titled this session, Doing the Right Job at the Wrong Time. There is nothing wrong with academics. Don't misunderstand me. We need those academic skills. They're very important. But we're getting our, our priorities a little mixed up. We're focusing on, the, on doing something good, but we're doing it at the wrong time. Because the, the, the key window for the development of spirituality, for character development, cause to affect reasoning, all very important things, that develops at an early age. You know, you've probably heard it said, give me a child until he is seven and he will be mine forever. Why? Is that because you can teach them a bunch of math before they're seven? No, it's because the character is set, the emotions are connected, the relationships are formed, the thinking is formed at an early age. That's the critical window. And we need to recognize that as Christian parents. What is our focus? Is our focus getting into uni or getting into heaven? What's the real goal here? There's nothing wrong with many of the world's goals, but they need to take second place to, our, to the goal, uh, the true goal of a Christian parent. Let's focus on the right job at the right time. I'll conclude with a couple of quotes. This research I'm bringing forth might be new, but they're not new ideas. The book Christian Education, written almost 150 years ago, in the early education of children, many parents and teachers fail to understand that the greatest attention needs to be given to the physical constitution, that a healthy condition of body and mind may be secured. It has been the custom to encourage children to attend school when they were mere babes needing a mother's care. Parents should be the only teachers of their children until they have reached, what age does that say? Eight or 10. Does that line up with the brain science we've seen? Does it line up with the eye development we've seen? Does it line up with the development of inner speech and, and all these other things we've discussed? It fits perfectly. As fast as their minds can comprehend it, the parents should open before them God's great book of nature. Here's a good book. <laughs> and here's a good schoolroom. The only schoolroom for children until eight or 10 years of age should be in the open air. I mean, the opening flowers and nature's beautiful scenery and their most familiar textbook, The Treasures of Nature. These lessons imprinted upon the minds of young children amid the pleasant, attractive scenes of nature will not soon be forgotten. All right. Um, what's the proposed schedule? We're going to take a break for, for lunch now and come back for the... Okay, we'll stick with that. So let's close with prayer. And then I'm sure you have questions on this, but we'll open it up for Q&A later on and we can have a, a discussion on many of those things. Let's close. Father in heaven, thank you for the insight you've given us. Um, I just pray that we can follow it as you would have us to. Um, give, give Again, give the parents uh, and teachers here the wisdom to follow your ways. And we ask now your blessing upon our meal as we partake of that and then... Uh, as we continue throughout the afternoon. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.